Good morning and Merry Christmas. It's Reverend Mike Capron from the First Presbyterian Church of Elmwood Park. Our Bible text today is from Philippians 2, 1 through 11, the very famous Christ hymn of that chapter. If there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, and being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The sense of our Bible reading for today. The Ruler in the Manger. That was the provocative title of the last chapter in Dennis Groh's book, In Between Advents. I'll get to the Christology of the title later, but for now, let's just think about what it means to have a royal birth. We Americans don't really wrestle with this. We elect presidents who are all adults and usually older ones. But if you happen to live in a monarchy, then you have to deal with the idea that that wailing baby over there is your future king or queen. One has to meld the normal business of raising a child with the understanding that the child will one day be your sovereign. Well, I can easily envision some comedy sketches around this. The young emperor exclaims, Bring me a chocolate chip cookie, slave. No, your eminence, it will spoil your dinner. <laughs> Off with his head. Bring me someone who will get me cookies, orders the youngling. You see the problem. And how much greater the problem when the youngster is not merely a human monarch, but the son of God or God incarnate. One can rationalize disobedience to a human ruler, but obedience to God is one of the things at the center of our faith. This is where we touch on Christology, or words about the nature of Christ. The early Christian church faced two main types of heresies by people trying to figure out a God who is also a human being, or even a baby in a manger. One heresy goes like this. Jesus was not born with a divine nature. He was born as a regular human being. Later in life, maybe at his baptism, he was infused with a gigantic dose of the Holy Spirit. That's a heresy, a mistake, maybe even a lie. Among other places, the Gospel of John chapter 1 makes that clear. Let me give you the other type of heresy. It goes like this. Jesus was not really a human being. He only appeared human. The flesh and blood Jesus who was walking around was uh, just some kind of puppet with God the Father pulling the strings. That is also a heresy, a mistake, maybe even a lie. John 1, it's interestingly, also refutes this. The word became flesh, as does Philippians 2, our text for today. But you can see how tempting these heresies might be as you consider the ruler in the manger. If Jesus wasn't really human, that heresy, well, he must have been the perfect baby, possessing all knowledge and probably instructing his parents in philosophy and theology as soon as he learned to talk, which might have been within a few days of his birth, I guess. Conversely, the other heresy, if Jesus wasn't really God, then he could 
do all the messy things that babies do, spitting up, projectile vomiting, and all that stuff that has to do with diapers. Um, and you really didn't have to listen to anything this Jesus said until after his baptism at age 30. The early church vociferously rejected all these heresies. And the definitive statement from the Nicene Creed says this, We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being or one substance with the Father. Through him, all things were made. Jesus is both fully human and fully divine at the same time. He was present at creation and also born of the Virgin Mary. He died on a cross, rose from the dead, and will come again. He is, as Revelation says, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Okay, but that still leaves us with what to do with the ruler in the manger, or more to the point, the God in the manger. Is this a point of embarrassment for Christians? Should we just gloss over it and hope nobody inquires too deeply? No, it is not embarrassing at all. It is a point of great pride, this God in the manger. This is the glory of the famous Christ hymn in Philippians 2. This face of God that is Jesus humbled himself to become the helpless babe in the manger. That which was invulnerable became vulnerable. That which was immortal became mortal. That which was omniscient became ignorant. That which was complete became partial. If you want to get a sense of this, read the end of Luke chapter 2. The 12-year-old Jesus amazes all the temple elders with his understanding and knowledge, but he was also listening to them and asking questions. He was perhaps a prodigy, full of understanding beyond that of most 12-year-olds, but he was not all-knowing. He was not lecturing them as a superior. He was conversing with them, exploring matters of faith together. And then right after that episode, there is Luke 2, 51 to 52, which says, Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to his parents. But his mother treasured these things in her heart. And, get this, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. If Jesus had already known everything there is to know, he could not have grown in wisdom, as the Bible clearly says that he did. Philippians 2 tells us that the God in the manger humbled himself, even to, to the degree that God had things to learn. This is an amazing fact, well worth pondering. But what I think is more important to consider is the motivation. Why is it that the Lord of all displayed such humility? And for this, I turn back to the first five verses of Philippians 2. If there's any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, Paul writes, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. And let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. My friends, when we show love and humility, we do have in us the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. Humility is the opposite of both pride and selfishness. It shows an ability to learn, to listen, to empathize, to show compassion and care, even mercy. In other words, exactly those qualities the God in the manger showed toward us. We do not worship a distant God, but a close one who understands what it is to be us. Hebrews 4, 15 to 16 puts this beautifully as it speaks about Jesus. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who is in every respect, 
excuse me, who has in every respect been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Finally, appropriately, let us end with love. Can the God in the manger love us? Absolutely. Every now and again, you see a picture of Mary and Jesus where baby Jesus is doing that thing infants do where he, he holds out his hands wanting to be picked up and she's reaching toward him. And you've seen this happen with babies. They see someone they love and they smile and they coo and they reach out for them and the adult responds by smiling back and then reaches down to pick up the small one and there's a spiral of joy as both of them get what they want as they both experience a connection of love. That's the thing about love. It requires two. Uh, they must both love each other or it isn't love. If, if one gives and the other just takes, that's not love. But when both enter into love, as parents and children often do, something real and miraculous occurs. A new life, a new baby brings a new relationship, a bond of love, and that love is tangible and real. And don't try to convince either infants or parents that it is not. And so the ruler in the major, the God in the major, and the Mary and Joseph and all the aunts and uncles and cousins, they all shared this bond of love. The infant and the parent reach toward each other and create a spiral of joy in the bond of love. Now in this sermon, I've spoken about the God in the manger with his human parents. God is the infant and we are the adults. But I can't end without hearkening back to my sermon a month ago where I quoted John 1, 12 to 13. To all who received Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born, not of blood or the will of the flesh or the will of man, but of God. This reverses the same image. We are the infants reaching toward our godly parent, and God smiles back and reaches to pick us up. The metaphor works in both directions, and that is the real beauty of it. My friends, to love is to care, and God loves and cares for us, and we learn to care for and love God, and for all the other people God loves and cares about. There's a mutuality to it all, a sense of community and connection, and it is so very, very beautiful. Merry Christmas, everyone. Amen.